are in listen only mode. Good afternoon. Good morning. This is Lauren Wenzel. I'm with the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're happy to welcome you to another in our series of webinars on marine protected areas with Open Channels and EBM Tools Network. Uh, so glad you could all join us. We have a great topic today. We're going to be hearing about satellite tracking of sharks and fishing vessels to assess a remote MPA. And with us today, we have Tim White from Stanford University. I will introduce him in just a moment. But before I do, I'm just going to remind you of the format that we follow here. I'm going to introduce Tim, our speaker, and he's going to present on this topic about um, satellite tracking and fishing vessels uh, in a remote MPA in Palmyra. And after he gives his presentation, we are going to open up the floor for questions. And so we really hope that you will uh, submit your questions and comments. There is a webinar, uh, there's a box in the webinar template where you can provide those questions in writing and then we'll just go through them uh, at the sort of the second half of the webinar. So look forward to hearing from you and a, to a great discussion. Uh, I think this is a, a great topic. We know that large scale MPAs have been increasingly established. This is a tool that's being used more and more. And this is an opportunity to look at how recent advances in satellite technology and big data have improved our ability to observe and understand the benefits of large MPAs. And Tim is a PhD candidate at Stanford University, and he studies the effects of fishing and various other protection strategies on mobile species, including large marine protected areas. And his recent work has focused on reef shark and coconut crab movements at Palmyra Atoll. And he has also looked at the impacts of small-scale shark fisheries in Kiribati and patterns of fishing effort across the Northeast Pacific Ocean. So um, welcome, Tim, and I will let you take it away. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you all for being here today. I'll be talking with you, like Lauren said, about how we can assess a global trend in marine conservation, the establishment of these very large marine protected areas. I'll begin this webinar by briefly touching on some recent developments and unanswered questions in the realm of large MPAs. Next, we'll dive into the specific case study where we tagged reef sharks and use a new fishing vessel tracking tool to understand the benefits of a US large MPA in the Central Pacific Ocean, Palmyra Atoll. And from here, we'll leave Palmyra to take a more detailed look at this vessel tracking technique and discuss how it may be useful in understanding other large MPAs around the world. There's been a recent global shift in the ways that humans protect the oceans. This figure shows the percent of Earth protected over time in marine and terrestrial environments. We see that the total percent of protected ocean has dramatically doubled in around the last five years. So this increase isn't being driven by small coastal MPAs like those off the coast of the United States. It's being driven by massive remote MPAs of unprecedented size. Some are the size of France in the middle of the ocean. Despite recent gains, this figure also shows that the total protected area is still well below global ocean protection targets of 10% protection by 2020, which the United Nations formally adopted in 2010. Even more ambitious, the World Parks Congress called for 30% of our oceans being protected. And if the last few years are any indication, large MPAs will be a central tool used to reach these targets. This is why I feel it's very important that we understand how effective large MPAs are for various conservation objectives. Large MPAs hold immense conservation potential, allowing massive expanses of our ocean to exist in their most natural state. The benefits of marine protected areas are often particularly dramatic for a less mobile species that stays fully within the protected area and therefore aren't directly exposed to fishing. This includes many reef fish, corals, and terrestrial species which also benefit as you often find a protected atoll and terrestrial ecosystem in the center of a large MPA. Like Lauren mentioned, these land species also include a coconut crab, which are land's largest terrestrial invertebrate, uh, and I'm tagging one in the photo on the left in this slide. But the question is, how do large MPAs benefit species that are mobile enough to actually leave an MPA, such as seabirds, tunas, and sharks? If they face a lot of fishing effort once they leave the MPA, then what does it really mean to offer a species partial protection for some of the time? Partial protection for mobile species is one of the key uncertainties surrounding large MPAs, of which there are several. At this point in time, the very necessity of large MPAs is being debated by a wide stretch of society, including researchers, fisheries stakeholders, 
and as you'll see in the next slide, the highest federal offices of our nation. A portion of the debate is focused on whether or not large MPAs will benefit mobile sharks, tunas, and seabirds. Another primary point of the debate is how you actually enforce fishing restrictions across such vast expanses of open ocean. In this photo, as we stand on the edge of Palmyra Atoll, the horizon that you can see if you're six feet tall and standing at shoreline is around three miles away. The boundaries of large MPAs can be hundreds of miles further, up to 200 miles total. So clearly this is a huge stretch of ocean we're talking about. Addressing this enforcement challenge requires technical innovation because virtually no MPA has the resources to physically patrol such a large area with boats and people. A final key point in the discussion or debate over large MPAs is fueled by not knowing what patterns of fishing look like in remote regions of the planet where large MPAs are typically located. Opponents of large MPAs question whether or not there's much fishing in these regions in the first place, and then they question why we would reduce fishing in this area if there's already quite little fishing to begin with. It's historically been very challenging to measure fishing effort in such remote zones, so these discussions have been pretty hypothetical as opposed to being data-driven since data is not normally available. Debates about large MPAs are not just occurring in academic journals. In fact, they're being explicitly taken up by Congress and the White House as I speak right now, surprisingly. Two months ago, the current administration issued an executive order calling for a review of 27 federally managed protected areas in order to see if their boundaries were too big, including the exact MPA where I work and where this webinar mainly focuses on. Our own research directly focuses on questions of large MPA size and effectiveness, so this has been a really unexpected experience. A federal task force has been created by presidential executive order to look into one of our research questions. This adds a touch of urgency to the mix and hopefully shows why it's relevant that we really do figure out uh, the benefits and potential limitations of large MPAs. Of course, MPA effectiveness can be defined in countless ways in economic terms or ecological terms, and fully depends on your own perspective. We chose to analyze the effectiveness of an MPA from a reef shark's perspective because many large MPAs explicitly aim to aid reef sharks. These are often called shark sanctuaries as, as exists in uh, Palau and French Polynesia, for example. For those who don't work in the tropics, gray reef sharks are one of the most abundant reef predators comprising up to 46% of upper trophic level biomass on unfished coral reefs. They're a very common predator uh, in unfair zones. Unfortunately, gray reef shark populations are declining on many atolls that are fished and they are listed as near threatened on IUCN's red list of threatened species. Despite their likely importance as reef predators, uh, this species movements uh, are still very unclear when they move away from the reef. They've been studied uh, kind of coastally when they're existing on the reef, but as they move away from the reef, it's very uncertain how far they go so it would be uncertain how they might respond to protection at this scale. To investigate large MPA effectiveness for reef sharks, we'll dive into a specific case study in the Line Islands, which are located in the Central Pacific Ocean. Here's the study site. This is an island chain around 1,000 miles due south of Hawaii. It's interesting to us because you have a US-administered protected area that fully bans fishing on one end of the island chain and several inhabited islands that don't ban fishing on the other end. Here's a zoomed in view of this system. At the northern end of the chain, there's the Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, which falls within the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. This is a 54,000 square kilometer tract of unfished, uninhabited reef in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In recent years, the MPA boundaries at this site have increased from 12 nautical miles to 50 nautical miles, and they were considered for a 200 nautical mile expansion so this gives us the opportunity to assess the impacts that such an expansion might have on MPA effectiveness for a given species. And throughout this talk, I'll mention nautical miles, but for our purposes, a nautical mile is essentially a regular mile. It's just a touch over one mile. In the context of this executive order, uh, what it may mean to reduce the size of this MPA is something we can explore with uh, the methods that we use here. Our field work takes place both within the protected area and within the unprotected regions of Kiribati beyond the protected area, and we observe the movements of sharks and fisheries uh, in both regions. 
So to summarize the goals of the case study in this system, we set out to track the offshore movements of gray reef sharks so we could understand how much time they would spend inside versus outside protected areas. If they do leave the NPA and swim to those inhabited islands, for instance, we aim to measure the rates at which those sharks are caught outside of the NPA as an indication of what partial protection may mean to a reef shark. Additionally, we analyzed industrial fishing effort coming from an international fishing fleet around the MPA to understand how large MPAs may alter a gray reef shark's risk to being captured in these fisheries. We'll first track industrial fishing in the context here in Palmyra, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll get into how this tool can more broadly be used around the world. Diving into the first goal. We deployed 11 satellite tags on gray reef sharks at Palmyra Atoll to learn about their offshore movements. This is pretty much how it looks when we're tagging at Palmyra Atoll. It is such a healthy unfished reef and we often see 40 plus sharks around the boat at a given time, uh, which is actually com complete contrast to the other islands in the area that are inhabited and are fished. These satellite tags, which are spot tags specifically, transmit the shark's position each time the dorsal fin breaks the surface, as may happen when a shark feeds. We received 1,600 uh, detections from these six tags, and each tag lasted an average of 8.1 months before the batteries ran out. Here we actually see one of those satellite tags breaking the surface as the shark swims. So the dorsal fin comes above water and the antenna uh, that the tag is attached to breaks the surface and it emits a radio frequency that's detected by passing satellites and then remotely will receive position information from that individual. And we can uh, download these positions and use a particular kind of analytical model, which is known as a Bayesian state space model to estimate the shark's daily positions from the pattern of those satellite detections. So this is the main method that we'd use to know uh, about shark movements and how they look when they are out of range of our, uh, the research that we can do directly on the reef at Palmyra. Here's one view of these satellite tracking results. Here, the red circle that you see is the former boundary of Palmyra Atoll. This was that 12 nautical mile boundary before it was eventually expanded to 50 nautical miles, which is the current boundary. That inner white line is the extent of the reef area at Palmyra. So all the points away from there are showing the offshore pelagic movements of the sharks. Different individuals are shown in different colors with each circle representing a daily position for that individual. The majority of detections are centered at Palmyra Atoll, but we see that you know, despite being named reef sharks, all individuals are, active, uh, are actually very commonly using the open ocean pelagic habitats. And in fact, all six individuals left the red circle, the former MPA boundary. This revealed to us that the former boundary was too small to contain the species movements and that the expansion of the MPA actually did protect more of the species movements. Similarly, in reference to the executive order, shrinking the MPA at this location would certainly mean that the sharks spend more time outside the MPA. So we would argue that this uh, is a negative thing from a, reef, from a reef shark's perspective. Zooming out, that 12 nautical mile boundary is still the inner red circle and the solid black box is the current MPA boundary of 50 nautical miles. The outer dash line going around the outside is the maximum possible size that an NPA could be expanded to under current international agreements. This is the US exclusive economic zone. We see that most sharks stayed within the current Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge boundaries for the duration of the study, which uh, probably matched our expectations, but we were a bit surprised to see that two of six sharks actually left these NPA boundaries with one shark swimming over 900 kilometers out into open ocean. This was a bit of a surprise for a reef shark. From this, we learned that sharks are, are certainly swimming beyond MPA boundaries. And before we could understand how effectively the MPA is actually protecting reef sharks, we have to directly assess what the fishery risks are outside those MPA boundaries. In addition to the satellite tags, we also deployed 262 numbered conventional tags. So these are simple pieces of plastic put on the shark's dorsal fin with our contact information on the back of them. And we deployed these tags to see if fishermen on neighboring islands would actually report these sharks being captured elsewhere. And then this would indicate to us the rate at which sharks tagged within the MPA were potentially being harvested outside the MPA, giving us some insight into MPA effectiveness. 
There's two components to, fishering, uh, to fisheries mortality happening outside the NPA. One comes from these smaller coastal fishermen and another comes from these larger offshore industrial vessels. First, we'll start on these small scale fisheries. Uh, and to understand them, I spent three months in the nation of Kiribati on those inhabited islands, working closely with local coastal fishermen to see if these numbered tags turned up from these fishermen. This is a pretty typical view of uh, Kiribati fishing operation. The small scale here means that they're using relatively basic gear, like a skiff and some hand lines to catch their fish. The fish are all sold locally and sharks are captured to uh, both consume the meat locally and then also to export their shark fins to fuel the shark fin trade. It's worth noting that Kiribati is an incredibly isolated and traditional nation, especially in the outer islands that don't have an airport or a deep water harbor. So there's very little electricity and there's virtually 100% reliance on the ocean for survival. There's also the lowest per capita income in the entire Pacific Basin. And there's no regular transportation uh, to many of these outer islands. So to get out here, I actually had to contact private sailing vessels on the internet and found one that was fortunately passing through the region. Uh, and they actually agreed to drop me off and they were the last ship that I saw until they returned three months later when I pretty eagerly hopped back on board the vessel. I enjoyed the time out there a lot, but it was certainly a uh, interesting and bizarre field experience for me. Most folks on this island live in hand-built huts and they don't exactly have extra ones lying around. So the first training upon arrival was how to build a hut, which I very much so appreciated from the local folks. To retrieve any tags that local fishermen had captured, I interviewed dozens of fishermen across three Kiribati islands, the three islands that are closest to the MPA where we tagged the sharks. We also advertised our tagging program and our desire to retrieve any tags captured by the fishermen uh, by putting out flyers all over these islands, uh, by someone appeared on local radio mentioning the tagging program, and we also held dozens of these town hall meetings with local fishermen both for this study and for some related studies that we're working on. Out of the 262 basic conventional numbered tags that we deployed inside the MPA, we ended up retrieving five of these tags from small scale fisheries that are occurring in Kiribati outside the MPA. So uh, this is not like a mark recapture study that's occurring at the same location. These were in fact recovered at a different island up to 350 kilometers from the tagging site. Since these fishermen who operate in the region, they're coastal fishermen, they are operating in very small skiffs and they don't leave the site of the islands that they fish on, it, they are certainly not going to Palmyra to capture these species or these individuals. So this is direct evidence that some sharks tagged within the NPA are swimming to neighboring islands and ending up on dinner plates outside the NPA. We interpret this percentage as a very small percentage, it's 2% of the total. Uh, and so from this, we can conclude that Palmyra offers very substantial, though not 100% complete, protection to reef sharks. The next, uh, this, this teaches us about what the impacts of coastal fisheries are, but for the next component of fisheries mortality, uh, these are the industrial fishing vessels that are operating in the region. And they may or may not come to a port anywhere near Palmyra or Kiribati, and they may spend months or even years at sea. So understanding their impacts takes an entirely different set of methods because you can't just show up and talk to them. We've historically known very little about what industrial, industrial fishing vessels do when they're out of sight. So it's been very challenging to understand how they are interacting with a given species. Just recently, a new vessel tracking tool has come online, one that I'm very excited about, uh, put forward by a collaboration called Global Fishing Watch which is a partnership between Oceana, SkyTruth, and Google. I'll briefly show you how we worked with uh, the team to understand industrial fishing near Palmyra. And in the next and final section of the talk, I'll get more into the methodological details of how these maps actually get created and how you can use them in your area of interest. On screen right now, we're seeing the track of a commercial fishing vessel being tracked via satellite through the Global Fishing Watch platform. By analyzing a particular type of signal called AIS, or the Automatic Identification System, we were able to directly see how a large MPA affects fishing effort patterns and what this may mean to a reef shark. Here we see a view of industrial fishing surrounding Palmyra made possible by the analysis of AIS detections. We see that when a shark leaves the MPA, the MPA being that white solid line square again, we see that 
Sharks face a pretty severe gauntlet of commercial fishing risks. Red on this map indicates that an industrial fishing vessel was fishing in a given one degree grid cell for more than 20 days over the two year period where we were recording detections, 2013 and 2014, while the darkest blue is unfished ocean. We'll dive deep into the method details in the next section, but for now, keep in mind that this is a minimum estimate of fishing pressure since not all vessels can be tracked using this particular technology of AIS. Very small boats may not have it, but overall, we do see minimal fishing uh, pressure observed inside the MPA, that solid square. And there's also minimal fishing pressure inside the uh, US exclusive economic zone, that outer dashed line. However, we see 200 industrial fishing vessels fishing in the region directly outside the MPA. So this is a slew of long liners and purse seiners operating in Kiribati waters and in the high seas surrounding the MPA. From this, we were pretty pleased to see that virtually all vessels were respecting MPA boundaries that we could observe. And we concluded that large MPAs can in fact effectively reduce fishing effort throughout their boundaries, which in itself is a pretty major point of contention. We also concluded that from a reef sharks perspective, since there is quite dramatic fishing effort surrounding many large MPAs, uh, that particularly large MPAs can be quite useful because movements into unprotected waters would bring them into contact with yeah, pretty severe commercial fishing effort. And in the context of executive orders, if large MPAs were to shrink in some instances that would surely result in uh, reef sharks coming into greater contact with industrial fisheries. Using this tracking technology, we can also see where these vessels are coming from and what specific gear type they're using. We can see that fishing near remote MPAs is a globalized enterprise with 12 nations spanning the Americas, Europe, and Asia fishing just beyond Palmyra's boundaries. To summarize the Palmyra case study and then get more into the AIS technology, uh, bringing all this information together, we learned that gray reef sharks travel further than many of us would have expected. We had good reason to expect that they left the reefs from some stable isotope work showing some uh, pelagic prey in their diet, but to swim almost a thousand kilometers was a bit of a surprise to us. And this definitely shaped how we viewed large MPAs for them. We see that overall, large MPAs like Palmyra offer really critical protection to reef sharks. But this protection is not 100% because we did find that some sharks tagged within an MPA at Palmyra end up in the shark fin trade in Kiribati. But this is a quite low percentage, 2% of the total sharks tagged. Finally, expanding Palmyra from the previous boundaries to the current boundaries, from 12 to 50 nautical miles that is, uh, decreased the amount of time that sharks spend outside the MPA but even the largest conceivable MPA can't fully reduce overlap with industrial fisheries. So we feel that we'll likely need concurrent conservation measures in addition to large MPAs to help conserve these species. This may include curtailing demand for shark fin trade and some gear restrictions in addition to some place-based conservation measures. Now we'll transition from this Palmyra case study to speak more broadly about how AIS works and how it may be used globally. First, I'll provide some context for why AIS tracking may be necessary and how it compares to other information sources that are available. This map currently is showing a bunch of detections throughout the Pacific Ocean and the globe, in fact, of AIS uh, signals being received by boats and plotted by Global Fishing Watch. There are three main ways that we've learned about offshore industrial fishing in the past. One way is by placing fisheries observers on board. So I was a fisheries observer, that's me in the bottom left-hand picture, and I think that this produces amazing quality data uh, and, and really is critical to the management of many fisheries. It's also quite costly, it's expensive to pay observers to go on board and to train them, and many fisheries don't use observers, and they aren't required to use observers. So it provides great information for some fisheries, but for other fisheries, we have quite little information. Additionally, many other fisheries rely on information that is actually self-reported from a vessel. So a captain may be required as terms of his permit to keep a logbook of some catch and, data, uh, catch and effort data, for instance. This is also really useful because it produces a large volume of data, but of course, in some cases, it's uh, subject to potential misreporting, either accidentally or intentionally. 
in some cases it's possible uh, if the information is self-reported for it to be false. The third data type is the one that we chose to use in this case, which also has pros and cons. And this is electronic monitoring for a vessel to directly collect information on its activity. Similarly to how we tracked sharks and then interpreted where they were going and uh, what they were doing, uh, we also began to track fishing vessels. So we took advantage of this technology that I briefly mentioned earlier, known as the automatic identification system. This technology has been around for over a decade. Vessels broadcast their position and their vessel ID to avoid collisions with other vessels. So it was conceived and originally designed as a vessel to vessel collision avoidance device versus a true tracking device. And like I said, that the technology has been around, but more recently, satellites have been launched to directly collect these transmissions and then from there interpret the phishing behavior. AIS is required by uh, UN Law of the Sea and by most individual nations for larger vessels. This often means vessels over 300 tons or in some cases vessels over 65 feet and individual nations may modify this to be more strict. So they, they may require that all fishing vessels have to have it, for instance. So to, the takeaway from that is that this is a very useful technology for tracking most of the industrial fishing vessels on the high seas, but it would be less appropriate for trying to track small coastal vessels because many of them aren't obligated to carry AIS and uh, they may choose to carry AIS for the benefits of uh, collision avoidance, but many of them do not. Just recently, satellites have been launched and uh, essentially big data analytics have become now capable of using satellites to collect this information that vessels freely transmit. Then machine learning algorithms can be used to identify the regions of the tracks that are indicative of fishing. It's pretty straightforward for a lot of these large vessels. So there'll be a long straight line where a vessel is transiting maybe hundreds of miles from a port to a fishing spot. Uh, and they do that in a pretty constant course and a pretty constant speed. Then once they're on the fishing grounds, their course and their speed tends to vary quite dramatically as a vessel is setting and retrieving gear. So you'll see a vessel slow down and deploy a long line for eight hours, for instance, and then you'll see it float there while the long line soaks, and then the vessel will retrieve the gear throughout this process, changing its speed and direction. So the machine learning algorithm uses the vessel's essentially the standard deviation of the vessel's uh, speed and direction to determine when it's going in a straight line and when it's not. After fishing occurs, the vessel will straighten out and go motor to either a port or another vessel to offload their catch, or they will motor to another fishing spot and then transiting behavior becomes quite obvious again from a pretty straight course and a pretty constant speed. Different vessels also have distinctly different tracks. So it's actually possible to determine a vessel's gear type just from their tracks alone. You can see a trawler making repetitive movements at a given depth. You see they'll go back and forth, back and forth, very typically in a given location. Whereas a long liner in the middle here, uh, you'll see them motor out to a particular area and then several back and forth motions as they may set and retrieve the long line several times. And this also differs from a purse seiner, which you can literally see making the circular movements to deploy a net, motor in a circle to enclose the net, and then retrieve it. So we're excited at this uh, fact because this means that not only can you see where vessels are fishing, you can see what they're doing and how they're fishing. It's easy to imagine how this may be useful for MPA management. So Global Fishing Watch's platform has already been used to detect illegal fishing within another MPA in the Pacific, actually established by the nation of Kiribati. In this case, a vessel was seen fishing within an established protected area. That's the blue track here that has been uh, fishing inside the green box of the protected area. And Global Fishing Watch was able to provide evidence of this fishing behavior directly to the Kiribati federal government. This resulted in a $2.2 million fine being paid by a major fishing company to the nation of Kiribati. And this is actually 1% of Kiribati's total GDP. So it was very substantial for them. It's important to note that I think that this has a lot of potential applications for detecting illegal fishing, but it also is a uh, key to keep in mind that it certainly won't detect all cases of illegal fishing. It won't detect many cases of illegal fishing because if a vessel is illegally fishing without AIS transmitting, it would never be picked up in these signals. And in some cases, the vessels that are illegally fishing are quite small and wouldn't transmit AIS. 
You can also directly tamper with AIS units and turn it off in uh, yeah, you turn it off or otherwise put some tricky information inside of this. But as I said, it already has been shown to be directly useful in some cases, but it's certainly not a foolproof tool. I'm also excited that AIS allows us to critically examine some of the other central points in the debate over large MPAs that have previously been had in a, a bit more hypothetical terms. As I mentioned earlier, fishing is often assumed to be very low in remote regions of the oceans where large MPAs have been created. This plot shows fishing intensity across the entire Northeast Pacific Ocean and lets us examine this. We actually see some of the highest rates of fishing effort just outside an MPA. So this black arrow points to the points back to Palmyra, and we see a band of really high fishing effort occurring in the tropical regions for vessels that are targeting tuna. Fishing just outside of Palmyra, like the numbers that I presented earlier, are orders of magnitude higher than fishing 100 miles off the California coast, driven by these large tuna fishing vessels. So the, one of the common arguments against large MPAs we're seeing doesn't actually have much merit in this case. With that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And if you leave the webinar with two key points, I would emphasize that large MPAs offer crucial protection to reef sharks. And additionally, that the analysis of AIS is a totally burgeoning field that should help resolve many of the current uncertainties surrounding large MPAs. So thank you very much. And I'd be very happy to take any questions that you might have uh, after thanking the many other collaborators and funding sources that made this work possible. Uh, this work was carried out with Doug McCauley at UCSB, with several collaborators, advisors, and committee members here at Stanford and Global Fishing Watch, uh, specifically David Kruzma, along with his whole research team, have been very helpful uh, in all this work. And then Palmyra Atoll Research Consortium and the folks who make these MPAs possible, uh, I offer lots of thanks to. With that, I'd love to hear any questions. Okay, Tim, thanks. That was great um, and really interesting work. So I think there will definitely be some questions. I will start with a couple that have come in right now. Uh, so one question here from Nigel Noriega is, do you have to make agreements with the industrial vessel owners in order to track them? The information that the industrial vessels are transmitting is publicly available and freely transmitted. So this differs from something like uh, another vessel tracking technology is VMS. And that's something where the boat directly forms a uh, pretty much an exclusive bond with a federal management agency. And then they're the only ones who have access to the data. One of the things that we're kind of excited about AIS is that it's hoping to be or shaping to be a very transparent technology in that the information is freely available and publicly transmitted. This may come with some privacy concerns or like some uh, understandable reactions to, you know, what does this mean? Is this areas where fishermen have typically been able to fish in secrecy? And now we have the means of understanding where they are and what they're doing. And to that, I would say that there are legitimate conversations surrounding privacy that should happen, but also that the, the era of the oceans, especially the high seas being uh, these in transparent regions where we don't know what boats are doing uh, will certainly be coming to an end in the next few years, both through AIS, but also through direct satellite observation and imagery of the planet. So there's like planet.com, for instance, that within this decade, we'll be taking daily photographs of Earth every single day uh, of all of Earth. So the it's, it's exciting and interesting that the uh, up until now, the regions of the ocean that have not been able to be observed are certainly a light is being turned on for them. Yeah, that's that's really terrific news. And you mentioned that in some cases vessels are turning off their AIS. How do local mm -hmm. authorities deal with that when that happens? So this uh, this is something that differs. It, we're, we're able to detect the what it looks like when a vessel turns off their AIS pretty clearly um, in the actual data. And different nations have different requirements and different responses to a vessel turning off AIS. So Iceland is my favorite example. Iceland requires many of their fishing vessels, uh, a huge percentage, to carry AIS. And they really rely on it as a safety tool for them. And the, their version of the Coast Guard will be monitoring all their fishing vessels. And there, if they see you turn off your AIS, they will be trying to contact you on the radio. And if they can't get a hold of you, within minutes, I've heard that they'll be launching like a search and rescue operation to recover you because they've assumed that you've either gone down or maybe you're doing something unusual. Uh, and so 
that's at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, there are many nations who aren't directly using this tool yet and wouldn't necessarily know if a vessel turned it off. And can you tell via AIS um, whether what a country's ves uh, country of origin is? Yeah, along with the, uh, there's a lot of information that's contained in the transmission, the AIS transmission that comes from a boat. So I mentioned that it includes a vessel ID and then also latitude and longitude coordinates, but it also includes the ship name, it includes the flag state, so it includes the, the nation of origin, it includes the vessel length and uh, a slew of other characteristics that can be really useful in identifying what a vessel is and where it comes from. That's the kind of information that we'll use to match uh, a particular details of a ship with uh, regional registries that describe a nation's gear type, which can be used to confirm some of the thoughts that we have on what gear type a vessel is using. And are you able to tell if a, if a ship is flying under a flag of convenience by, uh, by being registered in another country? Mm, that's not something I've directly looked at, but uh, I would bet that kind of associations and correlations can pretty quickly be drawn because it's, it's somewhat obvious if a vessel is a certain size and offloading in certain zones and flags somewhere completely differently, if that's the case. But that's not something I've directly looked at. Okay. There are a couple of questions about the local um, fishing that you looked at. Um, mm -hmm. One question from Amanda Pollock who asks, how far offshore are the local fishermen going? They caught five sharks, but maybe they could uh, be a bit further offshore. Mm -hmm. That's right. So when we learned that they were catching some sharks offshore, that was our first question. Uh, the immediate question is, are they going to Palmyra to take these sharks or are they catching them more locally? And to get a handle on this, I went out on many trips with the fishermen and recorded a G uh, brought a GPS with me. And from that, got a sense of average distances offshore. Uh, and of course, it's possible that the fishermen were just staying particularly close to shore when I was with them. But also the, uh, the reality of them fishing in Kiribati is that they're incredibly fuel limited. So fuel only gets dropped off on the island maybe twice a year, and each person has a very small quota of fuel. So they can only fish about two or maybe three days a week, coastally about 10 kilometers from shore, and uh, they just don't have the fuel to make it all the way to Palmyra and back. The distance would be like a 500 kilometer trip, round trip in a very small open ocean skiff. Okay, um, and another question is, how can you tell that the sharks that really swam long distances were not caught by a fishing vessel and had their tags removed? So there were a couple of questions about, about retrieving the tags again and how reliable that was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I guess the first part of that question would pertain to the satellite tags and looking at their tracks and saying, well, is this shark just on a commercial fishing vessel that's motoring far offshore? And that was one of the, our first questions as well. So it's a good question. Uh, we used a couple methods to verify that this is actually on a shark and not on a fishing vessel. First, we had many, uh, lots of detections on the far offshore region for the sharks, and we were able to look at the speed that that shark was swimming at and compare that to many of the tracks from fishing vessels that we know in a region. And the speed of the shark very closely matched what you would expect for a shark versus what you would expect from any of the various fishing vessel gear types that are prevalent, uh, they're like kind of common in the region. So that was the first indication that, yeah, it's not on a, uh, it, that was the first and most convincing evidence that it's not on a vessel. And then as a secondary check, we also looked to see, you know, are there any AIS uh, carrying vessels in the region that are taking a similar path? And we didn't see any there. Okay. Uh, so there are a couple of questions from folks in the Caribbean, I think, interested in this methodology. One question is, uh, do you know of any training or uh, folks who are doing this kind of tagging in the Caribbean? Hmm. Um, any kind of the shark tagging or the vessel yeah, tracking? Yeah, the shark tagging. Yeah, I, uh, you should email me for some specific papers and names, but I, I've seen some really cool work from shark tracking occurring in the Caribbean for sure. Okay. And, uh, I think I've seen a little bit different technology there, more commonly using a slightly different tag type, but also very useful for understanding large MPAs, and there's definitely local experts there. Great, and I will mention too that we will post this presentation afterwards and there will be a recording posted for anyone who didn't get to hear the whole thing or wants to pass it on to a colleague. And we will also pass all of these comments on to you, Tim, so you can follow up with folks. Mm -hmm. And then my email address is there at the bottom of the screen. It's timwhite at stanford.edu. 
uh, everyone should feel very welcome to contact me with any more specific contact questions like that. Great. Uh, so here's another question from Robbie Romer from the University of Miami. What sort of sampling bias did you have with your 17 spot tagged sharks and wanted to know about sexually mature versus immature, sex, et cetera. And do you think this might have affected the results of migration and large scale movements? Yeah, I definitely think that. Uh, so we had within the spot tag tracks that we received, they were all from male sharks which uh, may have been from males spending more time at the surface or may have been just because overall the satellite tag sample size that we have is is quite low to be able to make kind of uh, reliable inferences about how sex or how uh, size may be determining or driving their movements. So we tried to, since the reality of our sample size was that it wasn't massive, we tried to stay away from going too far into making uh, too many points about their biology within the species. And what we could do is point to the consistent patterns from those tracks that we did have and say, well, across these tags, they're all going offshore. They're all leaving the old NTA. Here's what we do feel confident about. Um, so there is definitely, uh, or, or could potentially be some factors of sex driving that, or it could be random chance due to the, the sample size. But while we saw that all the males or all, all the satellite tag uh, males were swimming far offshore, the conventional tags that we received from Kiribati, so those were those numbered tags that the local fishermen would recover, they were all from females, uh, which also could be, I mean, there was five of them, it could be random chance or it could be some biology at play, but combining those two results, we can see that both males and females are undertaking these substantial offshore movements. And the second part of Robbie's question was, do you think that 8.1 months was long enough period to really understand the, the gray shark movements in relation to the MPAs? Yeah, 8.1 months of the satellite tracks were the longest tracks that I have seen for the species, but it's totally true that if, uh, you know, if we could keep these tags on for longer, they're currently limited by battery life. If we could keep them on for longer, then I'm sure the movements that we would observe may be even larger. Um, and so given the realities of any tagging study that's limited by battery life, I feel that it's, it's the most kind of prudent and conservative thing to focus on the trends that you can be sure about, which, which in this case are that, you know, for instance, all the sharks left the MPA in this time period uh, without saying definitively that, you know, this is the exact distance that all sharks, or this is the exact distance that sharks move in an eight-month window. Because if we could tag for longer, we'd probably see uh, even more movements. I, Tim, I don't know if other people are hearing it. I'll just mention it. People can write in. I was hearing a little static just then. So if people are hearing it, we will try to fix that. Uh, so a couple gotcha. of questions I think about um, how this can be replicated elsewhere. Lizzie Duncan is asking, who can I contact if I'm interested in looking at AIS data and fishing pressure for my own project in terms of understanding uh, vessel impacts and, um, and transit and also the m machine learning algorithms? Yeah, yeah, you can check out globalfishingwatch.org, which is the uh, public interface for where this data is uh, currently being shown. And then there's a research, uh, there's, there's a man named David Kruzma who's very involved in their research program. And you can contact me for his information as well. Uh, and you can ask me any questions that you might have too. So those, so those of you that are resources going to the globalfishingwatch.org website, uh, uh, contact me and Kruzma. I can either send you that, 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 that contact information, or you can find hey, your Hey, Tim, I'm, I'm hearing from other listeners that they're hearing a lot of static, too. And it wasn't happening earlier, so I don't know um, if, if maybe you could uh, not be so close to the microphone or see if something's a little different just in the last few minutes. Hmm. Gotcha. Are you, are you still yeah, hearing right, right People are, are having a hard time hearing you at all now. It may just be the connection, Lauren. Yeah. Um, well, let's take one more question and we'll see if we can get better audio because I know people are very interested and, and uh, you're getting lots of uh, people interested in contacting you. Um, so I guess that the other question that's, uh, that's outstanding is, was the um, analysis of the fishing methods sufficient for enforcement if a certain type of method was not allowed in an area? So I just switched from one headset to another. Do you uh, much clearer. Uh, yeah, better. All right. I guess, uh, of course, the headset would conk out during it, naturally. 
Uh, that is how it works, yeah. yeah. Always. Um, what was that question? So the, ne the next question, well, I will say, uh, maybe you could just repeat what you said about Global Fishing Watch, because I think some people couldn't hear you because of the static. Oh, gotcha. I was saying that one of the best ways to learn about Global Fishing Watch and how you can access the data is by going to globalfishingwatch.org, which is the Global Fishing Watch website and where they have a public map for where fishing effort is occurring. And specifically, a man named David Kruzma. Uh, David Kruzma is very involved in leading some of the research that Global Fishing Watch produces. And uh, you can probably get his contact information directly from that website, or you can contact me here at timwhite at stanford.edu for uh, some contacts or for some brainstorming of ideas. Great. Um, and then uh, another question was about whether the AIS data is sufficient for enforcement if, for example, it detected a certain type of pattern that was illegal, that, that type of fishing was illegal in an area. Mm -hmm. It's been shown to be very sufficient uh, in cases like in that Kiribati case that resulted in that $2.2 million fine. It was very sufficient there because the vessel was inside a region where it shouldn't have been in in the first place, kind of unambiguously. So there's some unambiguous cases where uh, it's already been shown to be quite useful in an enforcement and a litigation sense. And then beyond that, uh, there definitely are some caveats with like, for instance, if a vessel is using one gear or another, and it's permitted to use one gear, not permitted to use another. I think that that's something that's that's being improved always, but I haven't heard of the gear type specific thing being uh, used in any litigation yet. Okay. And another question was, what size are the blocks that are used for AIS analysis and how are the data uh, summarized? What size are the blocks, like how frequently is data coming in? Yes. This is one of the areas that makes it much more convenient to study a fishing vessel versus a reef shark for me, that we've received these 1,300 detections from the reef sharks over that eight month window. Whereas with AIS, you're getting literally hundreds of detections every single day for each vessel. So you have a lot more to go on when you're trying to behaviorally interpret what's happening. Uh, so the data comes in, in some cases, every, every few seconds, it's, it's hundreds of detections, and then you're left with these you know, billions and billions of data points. Uh, that you can analyze really at a, at a quite fine scale. And the spatial accuracy is also much higher than the reef shark tag. So it's, it's, you can get it down to really quite a small area and quite small uh, spatial or temporal gaps. Okay, and uh, speaking of analyzing the AIS data, there's a question from Elizabeth Murdoch asking if you are, or if you're aware of other research that has been done to identify patterns that relate to um, shark fitting shark finning as a fishing type? Hmm, I haven't heard any patterns uh, like that are specific to shark finning other than their correlations with uh, like for instance long line vessels that are, are known to catch many sharks. The shark finning uh, fisheries that were that I saw in Kiribati for instance would be types that wouldn't transmit AIS because they're they're too small and they're too kind of uh, low technology to directly transmit AIS but I'm sure that people will use this to better understand where shark finning is occurring and, and what the patterns of detections indicate. There's been uh, cool work I've seen. Uh, there's a few cool papers I've seen that have looked at how you can use specifically the detections of AIS to, yeah, to understand what a boat is doing. And I have a question here from David McGuire, actually in two parts. One is uh, whether you tagged any tiger sharks at Palmyra and what we know about the range of migration there of those species. Mm -hmm. I haven't tagged any tiger sharks there, but I can think of a study. I can think of a study from the from Hawaii uh, where there's been a satellite track, a satellite tracking study up that way, showing uh, some pretty large inter island movements of those species. But I personally haven't at Palmyra at all. And the other part of David's question was whether you have provided this information to the Interior Department as part of their review of the monuments. Yeah, this is something that was actually really exciting. Um, so. Uh, one of the people on this project, uh, Doug McCauley, who was one of the senior authors on this, uh, he, during the period where uh, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument was considered for expansion, previously the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, when that period was uh, happening, they were considering similarly expanding the MPA from 50 nautical miles out to 200 nautical miles. And so uh, some folks, including Doug, then presented this information to Department of the Interior folks and to folks in DC as you know, one 
drop in the bucket of evidence suggesting that, yeah, these larger MPAs would be effective for these particular species. And so that, that was really cool because it was just directly passed along there. And then uh, I've enjoyed sharing this with the folks uh, at the Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge that I know. So I recently came from the International MPA Congress in Chile, and there was a meeting of the big ocean managers, which are the managers of many of these large-scale MPAs, and they're very interested in these kinds of questions. And so one of the questions I have is about um, sharing this kind of capacity and making it uh, more available to managers in other parts of the world. And I just wonder if you have any advice about that. Mm -hmm. I think that this is going to be a large thrust of Global Fishing Watch's uh, goals in the coming time here, and that a lot of effort previous to now, from my perspective, has been getting this to the point where it really is, it is quite a reliable means of understanding fishing effort. And then uh, I know there's been outreach efforts on their end to connect with some of these other uh, some of these other nations that could directly use this for their own management, and I think that's going to increase a lot in the future and that uh, David Kruzma over at Global Fishing Watch should be a great point of contact there if any specific folks want to engage more closely with them. Great, thank you. Uh, so just a general question uh, from Serena Adam asking, are you aware of other efforts to test the effectiveness of MPAs for sharks? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some other studies uh, that have, uh, I've seen, I remember one off of Florida that was looking at some satellite tracking that's occurred both inside and outside an MPA and understanding their movements in relation to them. And I think that that's all really useful work, uh, looking at different species and understanding across a range of species how these large MPAs may be modulating a shark's risk to being captured by fisheries. So there, there definitely is uh, other useful work happening on the topic. And uh, there's a question from Aaron Lowry asking, was there resistance from local fishermen to reporting tag recaptures? And I would just add to that, um, I'd be interested in the general reaction from the local, uh, the local fishermen about your work. Uh, what do they think about it? Yeah, that's a, a very, that's a good question. And one that I found myself wondering as I'm sitting on a boat headed to this island and with you know, my three months of food and supplies packed up on the, on the ship, how is this gonna go and how will this be received by folks? Uh, and before that experience, I mentioned that I was a fisheries observer up in Alaska, and my experience so far has been that in fisheries that are more directly, that are in more direct contact with Western management strategies, there tends to be some more weird, uh, kind of weariness or distrust related to science, which may or may not be a justified thing. But in Kiribati, at the specific islands I went to, they really didn't have much interactions previously with any scientists or fisheries scientists for a kind of longer time scale or even at the scale of a few months. So they were, they were very open to, they were just pretty much very curious about why I was spending some time on their island and not at all, uh, you know, kind of uh, distrustful of a scientist, which, which was really nice and very much appreciated. And some ongoing work uh, outside of this project is uh, work that's aimed at understanding some of the sustainability of their fisheries and how we can help ensure some longer term yield from their fisheries. So I think there is also some kind of common ground and mutual interest on, on both sides for some of the research that was ongoing there, which, which really also helped it along. And, and they, were, they were excellent to me in every sense and, and really helpful allies. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, okay, here's uh, just another question that's just come in. Do you know if AIS was on fishing vessels like the one that the government of Palau burned for illegal fishing in their waters? And is there new work now looking to detect poaching for other species? Mm, that's interesting. I don't know if that specific boat had AIS on it or not. I have heard about some of these cases. And uh, for instance, there was uh, another case that I'm remembering recently. There has been some National Geographic articles about a week ago with some very large quantity of sharks that were illegally found, I believe within the Galapagos MPA down there. And that was a vessel that had MPA on it. And so the tracks can be directly uh, pulled up and shown where that vessel was illegally fishing and where they were you know, illegally transiting through an MPA with that shark catch on board. So I'm not sure if that specific one had it, but I do know that there's, there's multiple cases of where vessels illegally fishing are using AAS, likely because they're not sure that this is now being used in this capacity uh, and that AIS has been a useful tool in confirming what some of the on the ground uh, kind of detective work has produced. 
So based on your experience, what do you think the, um, the gaps or shortcomings of AIS are that you would like to be able to fill as far as these enforcement questions? There's a really good set of points that I strongly agree with set out by Doug McCauley in a paper last year called Ending Hide and Seek in the Sea. And he writes about some of the kind of loopholes that should be closed in order to make AIS a viable tool or a more viable tool for kind of helping to manage some of these regions that are something similar to the Wild West right now. One of the loopholes is, is, is uh, having some means of making sure that vessels aren't turning on and off their devices which occurs I mean, quite infrequently, it may be like less than 1% of the vessels, but closing that loophole would still be nice. And then they also laid out some potential means of uh, where, the, where the bite in some of these regulations can come in. And I can imagine something similar to, or they could have also imagined something similar to like the insurance agencies requiring that AIS now is continuously transmitted while a vessel is at sea in order to ensure that a vessel is properly and legally fishing throughout the duration of that. Uh, like vessels are required now to have seatbelts and airbags, or like uh, cars are required to have seatbelts and airbags, where it's a kind of a necessary tool to ensure legality uh, throughout a fishery. So I see that as a potential means of closing a loophole. And then I've also heard that this can, and agree that it can be used uh, as a seafood sustainability tool, where the focus would be on having vessels be able to definitively show that they're transparently fishing and reasonable and legal reasons using reasonable and legal means and that this is something that could uh, benefit well-behaving vessels within fisheries that are maybe overcharacterized as negative. As in the vessels within a, a particular fleet can then demonstrate that they are in fact playing by the rules. Right, so a kind of instituting a socialization of some of these of these good practices. And just to repeat, I think someone had asked, the name of the paper is Ending Hide and Seek in the Sea. So it sounds like a really useful resource. Right, that's the one, Ending Hide and Seek, you know, in the sea or at sea. And that's, uh, that's led by Doug McCauley with his Global Fishing Watch team, published last year in Science. It's a science policy piece. There's a lot of really good information there. All right, well, Tim, thank you so much. I think people have really uh, found this fascinating topic and just great work, and we really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. And if I didn't answer any of your questions or only half answered any of your questions, feel very free to contact me. Okay, we'll do that, and we will also pass on the questions so you can see them in one place, and we will post the webinar recording at Open Channels. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Awesome, and thanks, thanks. Tim.